welcome everyone greetings welcome to the google hangout on world food day to discuss challenges related to hunger i am sam petroda chairman of india food bank and global knowledge initiative along with me i have three other distinguished colleagues nina fedorov is joining from washington dc mr jay naidu joining from south africa and mr torben du joining from world food program in new delhi india welcome friends i want to begin by thanking my colleagues for joining us and also want to thank our team of young talented people who worked in the background to put all of this together in a very short period of time vikash himanshu emilia sharmini rakesh and many others in the background the format today is that each one of us will speak for about 3 minutes then we will have a conversation amongst us four of us for about 15 minutes and thereafter we will open up for a broader conversation with others we'll get question answers and i'll pass it on to my colleagues we welcome your participation we already have large number of questions coming from all over the world because of the twitter feed and all so i hope this turns out to be a very good one hour that we will all focus on and really discuss some key challenges related to global hunger india food bank is an organization that we started about 4 years ago we have five food banks and global knowledge initiative is an organization out of washington dc where we take lot of expertise from advanced countries into developing world especially right now in africa to look at challenges related to agricultural food chain hunger is indeed a major global challenge it affects rural urban man women and it's in all continents in spite of all the progress we have made in technology development somehow we have not been able to address hunger effectively so the number of hungry people have gone down in the world but still large number of people go hungry every day the number is almost about 800 million people in the world i know for example growing up in india as a little boy people used to talk about challenges related to feeding then 5 600 million people today india not only has enough food to feed 1.3 billion but india has at the same time over 200 million hungry the challenge is multidisciplinary multi dimensional requires great deal of effort from large number of people it has to do with food chain and every segment of the food chain whether it is growing food storing food distributing delivering or consuming to me technology is at the core of lot of these challenges agriculture technology whether it has to do with fertilizer seeds 
storage technology, technology related to information and communication. I think technology is going to provide us new direction to address challenges related to hunger. At the end of the day, it is up to the community to take care of their own hungry. Government programs are essential. Global focus and programs launched by UN are equally important. But community must take responsibility to feed their own hungry. And that's the logic behind India Food Bank, which really came out of discussions here in Chicago at the World Food Bank, which is a major global organization in 30 different countries, feeding almost 40 million people. Community programs must augment government programs. Focus is required at local level, national level, global level. So I hope out of today's conversation, one, we sensitize a lot many more people to take responsibility for their local community. I hear thousands of young people looking for meaningful things to do. Large number of rich people want to contribute. And I think this is one very good area for people to focus on to help their local communities. With this, I've used up more than my three minutes, so I'm going to request now Nina Fedorov to spend her three minutes and then Mr. Jai Naidu and then Torben. Let's start, Nina. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> My name is Nina Fedorov, and my specialty is genetics and molecular biology. What I'm going to spend my 30, uh, my three minutes doing is introducing you to the issue of genetic, contemporary genetic modification. This is one of the most wonderful tools that we've invented in recent years to help us keep up with the growing demand for food as the population continues to increase. So let me just give you a couple of minute introduction to GMOs. About me, I'm the author of Mendel in the Kitchen. It's subtitled A Scientist's View of Genetically Modified Organisms. If you're interested, it's available. What's a GMO? A GMO is a genetically modified organism. We've actually been genetically modifying organisms for about 10 or 20,000 years. But today, oddly enough, that only refers to organisms modified by molecular techniques. And what does this mean? Let me show you in just a few pictures. This is our favorite binjal, eggplant or aubergine, if you speak other languages. But the, in the real world, these are subject to particularly a shoot and root borer that damages an immense amount of the crop every year. Now, how is that handled today? It's handled with insecticide. India, in fact, uses more than 200 million metric tons of pesticide annually. Why is this bad? Because it kills all insects indiscriminately, and many people die of pesticide poisoning. As you can see, this farmer is spraying with no protection. He doesn't have, as in, is available in developed countries, a, a air-conditioned tractor to spray it from. <clears throat> this is the reality in many countries. So what, what has been developed over the past um, 30 years or so is techniques for transferring genes from organism to organism. This happens in nature. Human beings have figured out how nature works and put it to their own use. So to make a Bt brinjal, you take a BT gene. Now, what's a BT gene? It's a gene, it's, it's just a, a name that has become associated with a particular kind of gene from Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a soil bacterium that the whole bacterium produces a lot of, of this particular protein encoded by a gene. It's the, the protein is toxic to insects. Farmers spray the whole 
bacterium. But what people have done is take just that particular gene and transfer it to the DNA of brinjal. And then what happens is that only those insects that decide to make a meal of the eggplant uh, die, but it has no effect on people or animals. This is remarkable. And this is what it looks like in real life. This is on the top left are non-BT brinjals and on the right are BT brinjals. Again, on the left and the bottom, you can see the insect holes. On the right, you don't. Now, people worry a lot about Navi, the safety. Navi, I don't see the uh, slides. Oh, I'm, I think I... Okay, that's all right. Let's just quickly go through okay. it. I don't see the slides. All right. I okay. uh, will repeat the sharing. I thought I started with sharing. Yeah, but let's just... That's okay. Yeah. Let's just quickly go on. Okay. I'm sorry. No, no problem. Um, yeah, I'll see it now. Here's, now see. Here's, here's the result. Yeah, and here's what, what happens. There you are. There's yep. a transfer of a gene, and it affects the insect, but it doesn't affect people. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, okay. That's the message. Great, I'm Nina. Thank you. Very pleased to, to, to answer any questions that people have about the safety. Well, I'm sure you have lots of questions, okay. Nina. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam, and it's a great pleasure to join this hangout. Uh, I chaired the Global Alliance to Improve Nutrition. It's a public-private partnership launched at the UN Summit on Children in 2002, and uh, as a partnership between the UN agencies, the private sector, civil society, academia, and science to address the challenge of, you know, of malnutrition. Jay, can you speak a little louder because you are still coming very low? That faces to address the challenge Come closer. that faces two billion people in the world. And today we work in over 35 countries running large scale programs around fortification of basic foods, working on the thousand day program to identify where malnutrition is the most important to address, which is in pregnant mothers and children under two. But I also, as a, you know, having been in government under Nelson Mandela and from civil society, I also sit on a board of a global of an African foundation called the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, looking at governance in Africa. One thing that I can say around food is that the food system is broken. You know, the challenge that faces us in Africa is that we sit with a billion people that will grow to 2 billion people in 2050, by which point a quarter of the world's population is African. At the moment, half our population is under 19. And by the end of this century, half the young people in the world will be African. 40% of these young people are today stunted, or one in four are malnourished. And a lot of this hunger and malnutrition, we say, in Africa is linked to poverty and inequality. But if you look at Africa and our opportunities and our assets, I think our biggest challenge is creating pathways of hope and opportunity, understanding how we can use our assets to provide livelihoods that improve the income of young people. We have a third of the mineral wealth in the world. We have 60% of the remaining arable land in the world, 15% of the forest, 20% of the land service. You know, as many people in the slums in Africa say, we walk on gold, yet we remain poor. So my thesis at the core of solving the hunger challenge in the world, to be very honest with you, Nina, I don't believe in GMO. That's my personal view. I think that the core of of the challenges that face us around agriculture is to go back to making the smallholder farmer the core of our solution. You know, today 570 million smallholder farmers across the world produce close to 60% of our food. And so, if you look at Africa, there are incredible barriers that face particularly women farmers. They own only 1% of the land, they access 10% of the, of the extension services, and if you want to build 
agriculture as a viable sector in Africa to challenge what I'm seeing as an increasing corporate takeover of our land in Africa. Then we have to look at the women, not the science, making the woman the core of our solution, and making sure that she has access to seed, to microfinance, to water, to irrigation, and even <coughs> the FAO confirms that if you do this, if you make them successful, 150 million people in the world will not be malnourished. So I look forward to the discussion and the conversation, but I think that sometimes, we have to go back to what worked in the past to make sure it works in the future. Thank you, Jay. Carbon, thank you. Uh, thank you very much <clears throat> for having organized this. Um, I work for the World Food Program in, uh, in India. Uh, and uh, for, for the World Food Program, it's uh, very important to uh, have this World Food Day to bring attention to uh, the problems of hunger in the world. Um, we know there are 800 million uh, people affected by uh, food insecurity and hunger in, in different ways. And uh, a very large part of them actually live in India, which is a middle-income country. So you may expect that middle-income countries would be able to solve these problems. And uh, the government of India is doing a lot, but uh, even so, uh, a lot of problems persist in, in a, and also in many other middle-income countries. So actually, today, more than half of the food insecure people, they live in middle-income countries. I think that's a fact that uh, should be reflected on when uh, we talk about hunger and then the solutions to them also. Now, uh, what does hunger mean and then uh, why do we have the, uh, the Zero Hunger Campaign? Uh, in the first place, uh, hunger uh, affects a lot of children in, in the world. Uh, if uh, zero hunger was implemented, uh, we would save more than three million uh, lives of children every year. Uh, also, if, uh, if you look at the economic aspect, uh, the, the uh, hunger is a drain on the growth of the uh, all countries. Uh, it's estimated it's up to that the uh, DNP is 16% uh, 16 lower than it could have been if every uh, child and, and adult had been probably nourished from the, from the birth. Also, the, uh, if you invest, if you look at the investment side of it, uh, if you invest in hunger, then the return of the investment is uh, more than 15 times and sometimes much, much higher depending on the type of intervention. So there's a clear, it's clearly a good investment. Uh, but also, uh, if you look at the, uh, the, uh, the effect of uh, proper nutrition in, in the childhood, uh, it means that uh, the lifetime earnings of people can go up with as much as 46% per person. And uh, if you look at the other things, uh, like uh, micronutrient deficiencies, if you have iron deficiency, if, if that problem is solved, the, uh, the productivity will go up by about uh, 20 percent. So these are quite uh, substantive numbers. Uh, so when when you look at it, uh, then it's uh, clear that uh, the problem of hunger is not just uh, affecting those who are uh, suffering from it directly, but it also has an impact on society. And, and that's why it should be a task for everybody to uh, help resolve these problems. And that's also why we uh, see the, uh, the Zero Hunger Campaign as launched by the Secretary General as an ex excellent instrument for uh, getting the uh, support from the wider public and from everybody to uh, advocate for finding proper solutions to, to these problems. Let's take one, one more example. Um, if you look at, uh, at the undernutrition of small children, uh, if they don't get proper nutrition the first two, three years of their life, they'll be stunted. And stunting is not just uh, being small uh, in terms of height, uh, according to the age, but it affects uh, also the growth of the brain. The brain grows only until children are two, three years old. And after that, they have to live for whatever they have. So the, the problem that, uh, that is a tragedy is that uh, a lot of children in the world they don't get enough food or the right food. 
until uh, when they're growing, when the brain is growing. That means that there will be standards, not only physically, but also mentally, the rest of their life. And then you can uh, imagine what the implications are for these uh, children when they have to go to school and learn and their problems in learning uh, the normal curriculum later in life and they have to find a job. They will have to uh, do with the most uh, simple jobs because they will simply not have the mental capacity to more advanced task or higher education to talk about that. Um, furthermore, you, you have also the situation that uh, these things, uh, these things of uh, undernutrition and stunting, they tend to go from one generation to the other. So if you have a girl that is stunted when she's a child, she grows up malnourished, she will often also marry early, and uh, being malnourished as a teenage uh, bride, as we see here in India, she will probably give birth to another undernourished baby, an underweight baby that will have the same symptoms. So it's a quite a dramatic situation for both the people but also for society. And that's why we're very happy that uh, we have this Zero Hunger campaign where we work together with the FAO, uh, EFAT and, and UNICEF and many other organizations within the UN as well as uh, government uh, partners and uh, NGOs and, and other organizations worldwide. So we welcome this initiative. I think it's really uh, excellent that uh, so many people are coming together to uh, to work in, in solving these uh, critical issues. So I think I'll stop here and then... Uh, thank you. Thank Thanks, Torben. I think it's good that we all laid out sort of different areas to focus on. If I have to summarize this sort of initial opening remarks, I would say we all recognize that there is a major challenge. Nina talked about the potential of technology, GMO. Jai talked about farming, empowering women, nutrition, and Torben talked about predominantly economic challenges and implications of hunger, whether it's in terms of growth, jobs, IRR, children's health, brain, future, potential for the country. And I'm glad that we have a mission on zero hunger. One area we didn't talk enough about is the waste. And I see lots of questions already on the screen from a variety of people, whether it is Sohail or Muniraha or others, they are all at least on this screen of mine, focused on waste. I'm told that 30 to 40 percent of the food is wasted in developing countries before it gets to the table and in developed countries after it gets to the table. So I think let's have a little bit of conversation between four of us on how we all see this going forward. Yeah, you want to comment? Yes, uh, I, I think this is a critical challenge. Solving the waste problem <clears throat> is about looking at the value chain of agriculture. Correctly, what you said is for people who are poor, the, the waste is before it reaches the table. So we've got to look at what are the barriers that stop poor communities being able to deal with that waste. And that is about the role of government. The role of government in providing the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. It is about the aspects of the value chain that allows people to have the coal chain, the storage facility, the road network. It is also about access to the market. And uh, I think we have to do a lot more to make sure that farmers are part of market access. Now, Brazil did something really good. Under President Lula, family farming was recognized, and local government had to buy a third of a farmer's project. So immediately it raised incomes of farmers, and we know from evidence that if a woman in particular has 
increased incomes, there's about an 80 to 90 percent chance that the money will go into education, health, and nutrition of their children. Now, for post-harvest, I think a lot of it is the type of lifestyle of access that men, many in the developed world live in, and that increasingly the elites in the developing world live in. And that's about the control of the food system, and this is where the food system is broken. Because we know in fact, we there are a lot of studies going on. Yeah, in fact, there are a lot of studies going on right now. I know that GKI is doing a study sponsored by Rockefeller Foundation on the food chain wastage. Uh, Nina Torben, do you want to add? Yeah, I, um, I, I want to add only that um, what GKI has been asked to do is to help the Rockefeller Foundation identify where in this supply chain the critical links are and how we can in, include people on the ground. How can we organize uh, to more effectively engage everyone in the process of improving, of decreasing food wastage? Darwin? Well, uh, in, in WP, we've been we're working with the government of India in order to uh, increase the efficiency of the public distribution system in India, which is a social safety net with uh, food uh, as the central uh, element. Mm -hmm. And it covers around, uh, we cover around 800 million people. And uh, WP is working with the government in order to uh, see how we can reduce the cost and also the, uh, the waste uh, that, that may be in the system. Uh, by introducing uh, new technology, uh, computerized uh, information systems, and, and also to some extent use uh, biometric verification to make sure that the right people act actually get uh, the entitlements. Mm -hmm. There are many, many other examples of uh, innovative uh, modalities uh, that the WP is using with cash and vouchers in, in many countries where we are looking at how can you uh, avoid transporting food uh, from one end of the world to the other if there are functioning markets and maybe the right solution is uh, to give the people who are uh, confronted with food insecurity, give them a cash or cash transfer so they can buy the food on the market. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, using the, uh, the, the functioning market system to uh, bring access to the people who need it. You see, I think there are a lot of efforts going on, and I can tell you from my little experience in India, says that problems are pretty well known. Lots of people are trying, but the basic challenge is we have not been able to focus on our efforts. For example, three, four years ago, along with my colleague here in Chicago, Mehul Desai, he and I looked at the potential for a center for food security in India, where you really create one single agency within government of India to really bring all of these resources together to address hunger. You almost did a national mission on eliminating hunger by 2020, 2025, 2030, whatever. And then you need to provide mission director, missionaries, missionary zeal, technology. And then you need to bring public-private partnership, NGOs. Yeah. All of these should come together, but there is no national mission. So everybody is doing this as their routine job. The one who is head of food security today will be transferred in six months. Somebody else will come. Until you bring national focus Get the right kind of domain experts and leadership together. Leave them alone in place until hunger is eliminated. Zero hunger should be a global mission. Today it's a conversation. So I think this would be a good time to open up for conversation. We have about 30 minutes. And I must tell you that there is fair amount of interest from people. In fact, I have a series of questions here. Let me just take one or two, and I will pass it on. Uh, one question is from Raghu, which says, 
how to improve distribution logistics technology and policy that would be a significant progress towards zero hunger i mean these are all very important questions let me read one or two more so maybe we can just combine you know how do we create a social movement for zero hunger that's from ashok in mumbai there is a question from uganda which is addressed to sam and jay says what should developing and poor countries do differently to reduce the number of hungry people maybe we should take some time now to answer some of this uh, torben you want to start with torben you want to start with the sort of un approach to it and then maybe jay can talk about the african approach <clears throat> how do developing countries deal with waste is also a question asked to united nations torben yeah uh, i i believe that uh, each country has specific challenges and opportunities that uh, needs to be looked at it's it's very different to generalize difficult to generalize uh, a continent like africa or even india as a country mm -hmm. uh, i think one one uh, one thing that has been proven uh, to be effective that is for the governments to establish establish effective safety nets that will uh, address the hunger issues for the most vulnerable uh, people in in their countries and uh, this is uh, one of the things where wp has been working with many many countries uh, governments throughout the world uh, in the past we had a big program in south korea today it, uh, we don't have it there in china we had it in brazil and mexico and so on we faced out many many countries where they have well maybe not solved all the problems but they are now dealing with these problems uh, with their own resources so and also if you look at india india used to be <clears throat> the food importing country in, in a large scale it was one of the biggest uh, countries or offices in in, in of wp was in india today the, the wp office in, in india is one of the smallest in the world in terms of for activities and budgets but uh, that's because we don't really uh, do any food distribution in india we work with the governments with the aim of making uh, their systems better and more efficient so if if you look at the, also the, uh, the the hunger challenge there are like three dimensions to it one is uh, the calorie deficit which is basically what's uh, being addressed in india through the food safety nets but there are two more uh, deficiencies that are not being talked about as much one is the protein deficiency and the third one is vitamin and uh, mineral deficiencies both are equally important for the well-being and then the the uh, the growth of, of children and for adults to have a, a productive life and all of those should be addressed in in, in this context but the you know, one, one request i would have torben is let's be brief because we have a lot of questions okay so well, i recommend all our colleagues to be brief precise and focus Please. Yeah, uh, it's it's a, it's about food diversity. It's about identifying who will really need it and establish proper uh, safety nets that addresses uh, the most urgent needs for these people. Yes, Jay. You know, Sam. I think that we can't take the politics out of hunger. The fact of the matter is that we have more than enough food to feed every single person, even the 10 billion people by 2050. It's mm -hmm. about the control of the system. who's controlling the system so that we have a billion people almost going to bed today without a plate of food we have 3 million children dying of causes we could prevent but we have solution you know i come out of a social movement i was the leader of a militant trade union movement that fought for freedom in fact and i don't see social movements starting up with people my generation so the question is where are the young people they build social movements and it's built at a local level it's not built in new york or johannesburg or delhi so i think we've got to think about when we're building a zero hunger movement bring young people into this conversation and listen to them i think that will start to build something because we have to tackle inequality in this world the increasing inequality that is driving all our problems well that's a food crisis the financial crisis the jobs crisis all the crisis the ecological crisis 
What can countries do? I think we must hold the feet of our leaders to the fire at the UN. When they come there to make grand speeches, who's evaluating them? Who is monitoring them? There's simple solutions to solve the hunger problem. Empower women, farmers. Give them seed. Give them water. Give them irrigation. Give them legal ownership of land. Give them legal title. And then give them access to the market so they can sell what they don't use. They can keep their children hungry. This is not a technical matter. This is a political matter. Absolutely. Absolutely. But technology helps. Like in India, without the contribution of Indian agricultural scientists, we wouldn't be producing this amount of food. Last year, we produced the largest amount of food ever in the history of India. Nobody talks about it. It was possible because of technology. Nina? Yes, indeed. Um, that, what, we're what you're talking about right now is the technology that was introduced by Norman Borlaug and, and Swami Nathan. But what's coming is also important it, it, to address, for example, the um, nutrient deficiencies, because mm -hmm. it's not just about calories. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm trying to share a slide. Share. Okay, you should be able to see this now. Yes? Yes. So, um, this has been developed by a Swiss scientist, some, uh, a group of Swiss scientists, Ingo Patrikis and Peter Beyer, but with the, uh, with the intense participation of, of Swapandata, who is currently the deputy um, director of, the, uh, of ICAR. And this addresses some of the developmental deficiencies, mm -hmm. but it is stuck in a different political trap, and that is a huge global movement to denigrate and dismiss GMOs. But frankly, rice enriched with vitamin A and iron can address many of those developmental deficiencies that we, are, that, that we bemoan at the moment. Thank you. Good. You know, we are getting a lot of questions. Um, there are questions coming on tweet also. Um, let me just take a few again, and then we can respond. But maybe before we go to that, I must say that this whole idea of making zero hunger a global and a national mission appeals to me a lot. Because that gets, like Jay said, civil society moving, mobilize people's opinion, and create the right kind of organizational structures. Without proper organizational architecture, a lot of these things cannot be implemented in the existing vertical silos. <clears throat> Hunger is not a vertical silo. It is a horizontal discipline which involves so many variables like we have talked about. And whenever you have multivariable horizontal activities, you need to bring them together in the form of a mission. And if that doesn't happen, it's difficult to focus. So let me take some questions from coming on Twitter, for example. Uh, there is a question from Ram on innovation. Innovation in agriculture equipment. There is a question on improvement of our food gain storage facility which is also cold storage from Anshu Kumar, which is also a technology question. Then it's, someone says, why don't you contact some competition in college and online to submit their ideas? I think there are a lot of ideas, and we come to that in a minute. But there's a question on crowdsourcing, basically. Can we take more food in our plate? than what we eat. We normally do that. Let's campaign against it. This is also part of the sort of food wastage question. Okay, and then there are more questions on food wastage in office environment, canteen. There is a question from California by Varun. We said, I am passionate about this problem and looking to help from Mountain View, California. There is a question from Delhi on conviction that some are more privileged than others. 
hunger and poverty needs mindset change. We agree, okay? Like I said, we know what the challenges are. World has enough food. There is looting going on. People have talked about, that's what comes from Kamala. Then people have talked about wastage of food during marriage ceremonies in India. Ravinder Singh talks about that, okay? So the basic challenges are pretty well known, as I said earlier, and people are really asking questions more so than saying, this is what I would do. I think we need ultimately for people to say, what am I going to do? I know the problem. What am I going to do it in my own community? If I can get enough young people to come and say, I will champion zero hunger in my community and not worry about demonstrating in New York or London or Delhi. I think that's the kind of collaboration we need. In every districts of India, I would like young people to champion movement for zero hunger. That will take us somewhere. So with this, I want to again ask my colleagues to quickly comment briefly before we go to the next set of questions because questions are coming in very quickly. Please, go ahead. Again, we have gone through a list of questions. I will again go through, uh, maybe start with Jay, then Torben and then Nina. You can comment on the last set of questions I read. And be brief, please, so we can take more questions. Well, Sam, I think that one of our challenges in, in Africa is because of climate change, poverty in rural areas, people are going to the city. And in the cities, they are going to live in slums. They are mm -hmm. going to depend a lot on industrialized food. Now, we talk about diverse diets. How do we protect diverse diets when people are buying food on the market? That's where government has to play a decisive role to make sure that the food that is sold in the marketplace meets the needs of people, their nutrition needs. But government has to ensure that we're talking about improving agricultural yields. It's not just agricultural yields, but human productivity. That means the food that is produced has to promote health. And that health and, and agriculture and nutrition are two sides of one coin. Now, I think that, you know, one simple thing, you know, in the developed world, increasingly, Junk food is being banned in school, yet it continues, companies continue to flood our school in our in the developing world with their junk food products. So we need to take a stand on that. The second is, you know, I understand that technology is important, but you know, I think that there needs to be a considerable conversation about what type of technology, who controls the technology. You have companies today that are vertically integrated. They control the seed, they control the pesticides, they control the fertilizer, they control the herbicides, they control the land. They determine the prices. They make the prices unaffordable for the vast majority of people. And the last point I want to make, technology is important, increasingly the stock of climate sensitive agriculture. Well, why don't we do something about what is causing climate change? Why don't we get those that control power that pollute the world to take decisive steps to stop it. Because we in the developing world, particularly in Africa, are going to pay for the excesses of these countries. Jai, the challenges you are addressing are very complex and they go far beyond hunger. And I am all with you when you passionately talk about these things. I think world is at crossroads today. World needs new thinking. This consumption-based model is not scalable, sustainable, desirable, workable. It is creating disparity between rich and poor, urban, rural, educated, uneducated. And hunger is a big piece of it. But I think the world really needs to be 
in a sense, restructured. But that's a very complex issue. I know you and I have talked about it at length, but people have to take responsibility to increase the level of conversation on this. Otherwise, world is going in one direction, privatization, global economy, IRR, financial markets, stock markets, you know, that's where the world is going. And that concerns me as well. Carbon, let's yeah. concentrate on the questions I raise and then we have the more questions coming. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, we need to look at this in two dimensions. One, one is the production side of it, of, of the problem. The other one is the exercise. In order to solve all these pro problems in related to uh, the production, you need to have alliances uh, that uh, look that guarantee the farmers to have extension service, the inputs they need for production, and also access to the market. And uh, last but not least, also fair prices. So it's actually economically attractive for the farmers to produce. On, on the extra side, it's again it's a price issue. Uh, to a large extent, uh, are prices too high, or are they accessible for for the poor section of, of the uh, of, of the population? If not, and if you don't have uh, functioning markets, then the governments should establish social safety nets that will protect the poorest people in this situation. That you find in in, in many many countries, uh, not only developing countries but also developed countries. Now, how to achieve this? That's uh, the other thing. It's not the problem, but how to achieve it. And I believe that uh, the only way it can be done is through partnerships. The world today is so complex and so interrelated that you need to uh, mobilize all the actors who could uh, participate in, in finding a solution. And here in particular, I'm thinking of, of governments, the civil society, but all, uh, not only in, in terms of NGOs, but also uh, community organizations. Uh, International cooperation can play a role in this, like uh, the UN and, and many NGOs, but also uh, entities like the private sector and research institutions. We all have to come together and, and uh, work in finding solutions in our respective areas. If you don't think in, in terms of a grand coalition of all who have a role and can play a role in this, then we may not uh, reach the target, which is zero hunger. And that's what I hope that the, the zero hunger campaign will achieve in the long run. Thank you. Dina? Um, I have to come back to the fact that the ability of India to produce as much food as it is today is grounded in better materials to grow, better seeds to grow. And that's, it's, it's not just about hunger, it's about poverty. And frankly, Increasing income levels by providing better seeds and better inputs is definitely part of the solution. It should not come just in, in the form of food brought in. It should start from the bottom. Thank you. Good. I think there are two other important questions that we should take because we have about 12, some odd minutes left. One question from Praveen Dharma is about private investment in foods in terms of cold chain, infrastructure, transportation, and all that. And the other one is from Deberaj from Calcutta. It's about what will be the role of private financing to achieve zero hunger in India. So let's spend a little five minutes maybe on investments especially from private sector and the role of private sector. I mean, these two questions have come up time and time again. So maybe again, we can take a quick round to just comment on these two investments and private sector. Jay, you want to start? Yeah. I think that the private sector is a critical component of solving hunger in the world. Because the private sector, in a sense, has expertise, it has technology, it has management, it understands systems. You can get a soda pop in the remotest village, but we struggle to get a bed net 
or a vaccine or healthy food. So we can learn something. And I think that if you're starting to look at urbanization trends, more and more people are living in slums with no land around. So they're going to be buying food in the marketplace. The marketplace does not work for poor people. So we've got to make this marketplace work for the poor people. That's why in the gain model, we say there are 60 to 70 percent of poor people earning less than four dollars a day that go to a marketplace. They're not buying it from big companies like Unilever. From a, a, the trader, the, the hammer mill. How do we work with that private sector to make sure that the food they produce is healthier, more nutritious, more affordable? So that's very important for us. The second is that the private sector is not just a big multinational. I look at a subsistence farmer and I see this subsistence farmer or the person selling vegetables along the side of the street is a trader, a part of a private sector. Why should we give the private sector to big companies? So how do we support people that are in subsistence agriculture become successful smallholder farmers that understand the market? There are big examples of how this is happening. And thirdly, I think that the investment of the private sector is needed. We need to crowd in the private sector. But the overall objective is that while there's a return for shareholders, there has to be a commitment of a company to people and building community cohesion and not just profit. They can make a return on the investment. No one is asked saying that they shouldn't. But put the health and well-being of our people at the forefront. Thank you. Torben, may I request you to just <clears throat> comment a little bit on the zero hunger program of the UN? Because we don't know enough about it. So maybe yeah. quickly, a couple <clears throat> of minutes, you can tell us. It will be very helpful. Yeah, well, uh, the Zero Hunger Campaign was launched by the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, last year. And uh, it has basically five objectives uh, that are critical in, in this discussion. So the first one is that uh, uh, there should be no stunted children uh, in, in the world. Uh, and the second objective is 100% uh, access to adequate food, food for everybody uh, in the world. And the third objective is that all food systems should be sustainable. Uh, and then the fourth objective is that 100% increase of the uh, smallholder productivity and income. And the fifth and the last objective is zero loss or waste of food. Now, is, there a timeline? is there a timeline there? Well, it's a 10-year campaign. So, uh, Awesome. It's, it's not something you can achieve overnight. It obviously requires a lot of work and it requires, as I mentioned before, a big alliance between all the key players in this, from governments to the civil society to community organizations to uh, the private sector, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody has to, uh, to join this and then make it work. Um, now, uh, in the, within the UN, uh, we have a number of agencies working on this. FAO, of course, is a critical uh, organization this, as they deal with uh, food systems uh, and, and uh, in particular, but also the increase of small uh, holders productivity and income and, and also the aspect of uh, zero loss of waste of food. The, these are some of the uh, key areas FAO is working on. Uh, the, um, the EFAT, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, um, more into objective number four, which is a 100% increase in smallholder productivity and income. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at UNICEF, they are, play a key role in, <clears throat> in relation to, to the stunting of small children. Uh, they, they are the lead agency in nutrition in, within the UN. And then WP, we uh, deal a lot with, with also this uh, supplying food to small children in emergency situations in particular, but also in the uh, access uh, to food at all times for all persons uh, through our programs. And uh, of course, this is a massive task. No single organization or government can do this alone. It requires that we work together in order to achieve this uh, goal, which will, in the, in the end, benefit uh, every single citizen in the world. Thank you. Nina? At the base is the productivity. And that won't increase unless there's better seed and better inputs. So that's to get a, a woman out of poverty, 
she has to grow more so she can sell in the marketplace. Getting access to the marketplace doesn't help if you have a tiny fragment of land and no access to fertilizer and, and good seed. So I think that, again, starting at the bottom and not denigrating what companies can do, uh, companies are getting very self-conscious. Nestle, for example, in working with cocoa farmers, there are many diseases that need to be addressed and so forth. And just simple farmer training is really important. So everybody has a role to play. And Jai, with all due respect, um, the companies don't control the marketplace. You don't have to buy seeds from a con con company. People buy them because they're better. Thank you. Right, let, let, let me challenge you on that because I disagree fundamentally. Because I think that people don't have choice. I spend time in slums, in formal settlements, townships with unemployed people. They don't have a choice. When they buy food, the only food that they can afford that's cheap fills them up with empty calories is junk food. The part, I'm not saying that all companies do, there are certain irresponsible companies. And we cannot run away from this, that the marketplace is controlled like the global economy and driven by inequality, the increasing concentration of economic and political power. If you want well, we, Jay, we should have, we should really, we should really close here because we have about three minutes to close and I want to take a little time to summarize. First of all, we had very good conversation. I am very pleased with the questions, answers, energy. I want to thank everybody, but I also want to bring in a couple of thoughts. We all understand that the problem is very complex. What are the things we can do now, which are low hanging fruits in a sense? And there, I want to bring in some Gandhian thought. I am at heart Gandhian. I believe in simplicity and some of these things that Gandhiji always talked about. The role of community becomes very critical. He had very clearly thought through sustainability, affordability, which are the questions that Jai is raising for the poor people. But in nutshell, we need awareness, which UN is doing. Thank you, and it's a great job. We need bottom-up approach, which Jai is talking about. Bring in community, worry about the poor. We also need top-down approach, that governments need to create national mission <coughs> on eliminating hunger. They need to create one organization consolidate, give sense of urgency, improve policy, and not leave loose ends all over. We need technology. That's what Nina has been focusing on, whether it is technology for seed or fertilizer or distribution or information, cold storage, private investment, uh, public-private partnership. But we also need young talent to come into the mainstream. This challenge cannot be left to private companies and older people. I want to see young talent coming into the mainstream. You know, I get lots of people from India saying, what can I do? And I tell them, go start a food bank in your community. So I want to say, this is a great opportunity for young to come forward and take responsibility. Anybody who wants to start a food bank in their area should let us know. We'll give them the blueprint, support, empower them, but then they, they got to work. This is a challenge that is open to everybody. Large number of people can participate and it will require a couple of decades. But I'm very optimistic today based on technology that we can indeed address this challenge. I'm excited about the conversation. I want to thank everybody for their participation, especially all my colleagues, Nina, Jay, Torben. We are from different time zones, so people have been able to adjust their schedule. 
I want to thank our young team, Vikas, Emilia, Himanshu, Rakesh, Sharmini, my colleague here, Mehul, and so many others who have worked in the background with Vikas. And I want to thank all the people who participated and asked good questions. I think this is for the first time I felt the questions were really good, pointed, and I hope if enough of us can focus on it, we can indeed make a difference. Let's continue this conversation. Given a choice, I'd like to have this conversation once every three months, and maybe we can hashtag food, global food alert. With this, thank you, everybody. Have a good day or good evening.